All right, well, traders, welcome to our session tonight uh, for options, indicators, and breakouts. Uh, I'm Ken Calhoun. I'm really pleased to be joined with my colleague, Larry McMillan from the optionstrategist.com. Uh, Larry, welcome to tonight's event. Well, thanks for having me, Ken. Let me introduce Larry and then I'll turn it over to him. Uh, Larry's got the first half hour, then I got the second half hour. We will be sending out a downloadable video replay of tonight's event for your viewing pleasure. Uh, Larry McMillan's the top world expert in options. He's a professional trader, best known as the author of Options as a Strategic Investment, best-selling work on stock and index options strategies. It's sold over 300,000 copies, so that's one of the very best-selling books in the entire industry. I've known Larry for years. He's a top expert and highly respected in the options uh, industry and options area. He's the winner of the prestigious Sullivan Award in recognition on behalf of his outstanding contributions to the growth and integrity of options markets. Larry also speaks at the Money Show events. Uh, he's a top expert, highly recommend him for all of my traders who are watching this or in the YouTube videos in years to come. Uh, absolutely learn from Larry McMillan at www.optionstrategist.com. So with that, uh, Larry McMillan, let's take it away and welcome to tonight's event. All right, thanks, Ken. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the current state of the uh, uh, market predicting option indicators. So, some of the indicators that I use are option oriented, but they all are really in one way or another, even though sometimes we're just looking at regular charts. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, just a quick word about our company. Uh, I started out originally as a derivatives research company, uh, publishing newsletters and, and selling research, but in recent years, We've moved into money management. Uh, we, we currently have over 70 million under management. We're a CTA, which is a Commodity Trading Advisor, and RIA. <clears throat> uh, and we also do a certain amount of option education, such as uh, this seminar. Uh, we have mentoring classes as well. If uh, 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 Ken said he was going to send out the PDF of the seminar, but if you want to go to this link, uh, you can look at discounts on some of our products. All right, so uh, mainly uh, I look at four main indicators, the most important of which is the chart of the S&P 500 index. But we also uh, look at equity-only put call ratios. We look at market breadth in a slightly different way than you might normally look at it. And we also uh, put a great deal of importance on the volatility indices, primarily VIX, but some of the other things there as well. So let's review where these things stand now, especially after we've had this breakout to new highs. Uh, there's a very important rule that I use in the markets, though, and that is many indicators are overbought for uh, long periods of time, uh, as they were 2013 to 2015, and as they are again now. But overbought does not mean sell. Uh, you know, I wait for clear sell signals before we sell, because if you try to sell an overbought market, it can just go straight up on you. Uh, overbought markets rise sometimes for a long time, and I think you're seeing that right now. And conversely, even though it doesn't apply right now, oversold does not mean buy either. So sometimes you get into a very bearish market, it looks very oversold, but it just keeps going down. So we look for confirmed um, signals. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so uh, just quick, quick review. Just uh, so uh, as I said, overbought does not mean sell. And oversold is not moved by. So here's the chart of the S&P 500, and we've got these three uh, points on it, uh, three good buy points, the double bottom a year ago, the Brexit bottom, and the U.S. election bottom. And now we're off to the races. In fact, here's, this is today's trading right there. It's on the chart. It's a little hard to see because it's right on the line for the first of the month. But we do have these stair step support areas underneath. So uh, last week we traded in a range between about 23.50 and 23.70, so that's the first minor support area. Uh, this next one here at 23.00, I consider that to be a major support area because uh, we have broken out, we kind of looked like it might have been a false breakout, we struggled with a little bit, and then we clearly broke through here on February 13th, I believe it was. And that's the one that you know launched this current uh, rally that we're in. So, to me, that that should provide major support. If we fell below there and got down to this uh, row of tops from December to January, 2270, 2280. I mean, maybe you could still say we're in a bullish trend at that point, but below that, we I would no longer say it's in a bullish trend. So, it's clearly bullish right now, though, and. 
you know, typically uh, this is the most important indicator because it's the price chart of what's happening. So uh, if you have sell signals everywhere but you don't have SPX breaking support, you don't have much. So right now SPX is clearly above support and, you know, that that's bullish. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot of confirmation to uh, the NASDAQ uh, composite, the uh, NASDAQ 100, the Dow 30, Midcap, New York Stock Exchange, Russell, everything is breaking out to new highs. Transportation index today. Uh, so everything is breaking out to new highs. And we're also getting confirmation from comfort, uh, cumulative advanced decline lines. So a lot of things are, are uh, working together there. So just to summarize uh, the SPX part of things, we, we have this minor support at 2370 to 2350, or major support at 2300. The trend lines are positive. In other words, uh, you know, if you're looking at Bollinger Bands or moving averages, they're all sloping upwards. And then overall, that's bullish. So our first chart is still bullish, and we're still staying with uh, bullish interpretation there. But let's look at uh, the options, because sometimes options are, are give a good warning sign on a contrary basis. And in terms of predicting the broad market, we look at the equity-only put call ratio. That means all stock options that trade. And that's several million options a day. <clears throat> um, the, the theory of put call ratios was introduced by Martin Zweig back in the 1950s. And it's basically this. If there's too many people buying puts, and we'll, try, we'll define what that means in a minute, uh, then that means really everybody that wants to buy puts or everybody wants to sell the market is already in, and therefore we want to act the other way, do something bullish. Conversely, if there's too much call buying, all the buyers are done buying. They're just hoping you'll support their position, and uh, it's the time to, to turn bearish. So uh, when Martin Zweig uh, in, in invented the put call ratio, he did it this way. Let's say it's IBM. If we sum up the volume on all the IBM puts that traded today, and conversely, or you know, separately, sum up the volume of all the calls that traded today, and we divide the two, that's the put call ratio. Um, I'm not sure why Marty put puts in the numerator of this fraction, but since he did, put buying generates higher numbers. So when the stock is going down is when people are buying puts, and the put call ratio will be going up in that case, since puts are in the numerator here. Uh, Conversely, calls are in, in the denominator, so heavy call buying will make this ratio drop. So when the stock is rising and people are buying a lot of calls, the put call ratio drops. I keep a 21-day moving average. It's uh, you know you need to keep some moving average because it's kind of a noisy series of data. Uh, but just in case Fibonacci has some meaning, I'll, I'll use 21 days. But what you really get is you get this inverse. You ideally get this inverse picture. So as the stock price is moving up, uh, people are buying calls and driving the put call ratio down. When the put call ratio rolls over and begins to curl upwards like this then that becomes a sell signal for the stock. And then the stock, if it's, you know, we're getting things working right, the sell, sell, uh, stock is dropping, people are buying uh, puts along the way and forcing the put call ratio higher. So during a trend, the public is right. It's just that it becomes contrary when it becomes extreme. So now when the put call ratio rolls over, starts to head back down, that's a buy signal for the stock. So ideally, this would be the case. And certain, uh, what what could distort this would be things like arbitrage or you know heavy block trading, institutional trading, that sort of thing. So when you're looking at a chart of a put call ratio, I usually like to have it overlaid with a chart of a stock. And on our website, we publish about 400 put call ratio charts every day. So just to show you the symmetry, this is the SPX on top here. This is not a current chart. And on the bottom is the equity-only put call ratio. And you can see that for the most part, there is this inverse symmetry. So using the equity-only put call ratio is uh, a good indicator for the uh, broad market. So here's the current standard put call ratio, which is what I just defi the, uh, defined there, where we use just the volume of the options. And, for example, back here, the market was declining in late 2015 into early 2000, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, into early 2016, 2015 actually points over there. And the market was declining during that period. People were buying puts, and then the put call ratio rolled over, and that was a buy signal. It was a good buy signal. So we've had kind of a noisy series of data this year, 
but the latest signal we had was another buy signal because the ratio peaked and is heading lower. And I don't really use levels, so you can see there were some sell signals along the same level, but the ratio could go much lower. There's nothing to prevent that. And so we're on a buy signal now since the ratio is trending lower, and when it stops trending lower and reverses and starts to turn upwards, then and only then would we have a sell signal. Now, with the advent of computers, we can do another kind of put call ratio calculation, and it's a little more sophisticated. In this case, uh, we're going to calculate the dollar volume of each option before we do the put call ratio. So at the end of the day, I use I use do it at the end of the day, I take the option's closing price and multiply it by the volume of that option that traded that day. And so that gives you a dollar volume for that option. So we sum up these dollar volumes for all the puts. And let's say it's IBM again. Separately, we sum up the dollar volume for all the calls on IBM this way and divide the two. And now we have what's called the weighted put call ratio. And now we're measuring the dollars being spent on bearish opinion versus the dollars being spent on bullish opinion. And this, in my opinion, in my opinion, I've used too many opinions here. Uh, my way of thinking, this is a better indicator. It's less noisy and it tends to go to extremes, which is what you like to see. So here's, again, about the last year or so, and you can see that this one is very low, but it, has, it is trending down. So the last signal we had was a rollover here. That's a buy signal, and it's going lower. It hasn't been this low since 2014, early 2014. And when it did get down to that level at that time, we had a sell-off in January of 2000. Uh, 14, but it wasn't a huge one, but it was tradable. So, you know, we don't have put call ratio sell signals yet, but we're at very low levels on the chart. So I would say they're overbought. But again, remember, overbought does not mean sell. So just to review here, uh, both these, I guess I didn't really point that out. We did hit, get some buy signals back here, some nice ones right around the time of the election. So we got those buy signals before the election. And again, we've returned to buy signals. And so we're overbought in terms of these indicators because they're very low on their charts, but we don't have a sell signal. And uh, I don't really have time to explain the whole thing, but we do a certain uh, amount of like uh, like a chess tree analysis on these uh, on these uh, charts, and uh, helps us determine when the ratio is about to roll over or not, and that helps us to uh, quickly discern whether. I think a little wiggle on a chart can really be a, a rollover, like a buy signal, or or not. Okay, so um, <clears throat> you know this is again a bullish indicator, even though we're overbought. We just don't have sell signals, so this we're still staying uh, with a bullish uh, case here as well. So uh, we use these put call charts on individual uh, stocks as well and individual futures. I'll just show you a couple of them that I think are kind of interesting right now. Here's Apple. And on these, I really only look for the extremes. So like any little wiggles here in the middle, uh, I'm not that interested in those. But these extreme ones, I am. So you can see that Apple had an extreme level buy signal back here in uh, late November, early December. And uh, that tur has turned out to be very good. Now the pick up ratio, at that time, what this uh, scale over here means, since this is a, the weighted chart, the scale 130 means $130 are being spent on puts for one of every $100 being spent on calls. But now, just a few months later, we've, we've, the ratio has come down and down and down. It's still declining, so people are still buying calls. But now we're all the way down here to about where they're only spending $25 on puts for every $100 being spent on calls. And, and that's getting to be pretty extreme. So when this does reverse to a sell signal, we will take it, but um, since the stock has been so strong, and since we're already long uh, from prior signal, I would actually wait, you know, for it to break a trend line or something like that before I actually act on the sell signal. Again, it's overbought. We don't have a sell signal yet. Now here's one where we do. This is CRM, and you can see that the put call, uh, this last rally that we've had this year. People were madly buying calls and drove, the, again, the ratio all the way down here to about where $35 of being spent on puts versus every $100 being spent on calls. And now the ratio has turned over a world and started to go higher. So that is a confirmed sell signal. But here, 
we're waiting for it to break uh, this little support area. So it's, um, it's a little hard to see on this chart, but if you look on a regular chart, you'll see there's, there's support in there. And I'm not going to take this sell signal until that support, unless that support is broken. It might not be, and fine, then I won't take the signal. And just one more, this is uh, Johnson & Johnson. You can see uh, it's been a couple of times when it's got way up high here. This long kind of decline made people bearish on the stock, and they were buying a lot of puts, especially earlier this year. And now the put call ratio has rolled back over. That's a buy signal. Came in you know, right here just after the stock started to move higher. And that's currently on a buy signal. You see the last one that came at more or less the same level was a quite lengthy buy signal lasted for several months. So those are just a couple of ones. Uh, as I said, we have about 400 of these charts on our website every day. Now the third indicator that I look at is market breadth. And this doesn't exactly have to do with options, but it does uh, the way we look at it to a certain extent. So breadth is simply daily advances minus declines, and you can keep a cumulative total, or you can you can compute an oscillator. You can do a number of things. So uh, you know, we're, I don't want to get too complicated with it here. So we're just going to look at uh, one simple approach, and that's the oscillator. So the oscillator is calculated this way: we take 90% of yesterday's value of the oscillator, and and then add on 10% of today's uh, difference advances minus declines. So to get started keeping this yourself, you'd need yesterday's value. So if you're interested in doing it yourself, just shoot me an email. My address is uh, down here at the bottom. And I'll send you the value to get started, and then you can keep it yourself. But we use a bit of a trick. We use what's called stocks only. I don't really like using a New York Stock Exchange breadth because there's too many things on New York Stock Exchange that are not stocks. So we, uh, you know, we're just using uh, a, a different way to look at that, and that's all optionable stocks. So um, we look at there's about six thousand, there's even more actually. So we look at the all those stocks that have been advanced today, and of those stocks that have declined today, we calculate the breadth oscillator. So here's the S and P chart on top. This is current right up to uh, current time, and on the bottom is the oscillator. So Anytime it gets above 200, uh, that's overbought and that's red. So again, remember, overbought does not mean sell. It only means sell when it falls back out of an overbought condition, like right, right there. So for example, right after the election, the market got very overbought immediately, but that was strength, and so it took off uh, in great, in, in, uh, a big move. Actually, that, that might be more than. Double bottom from last. That's the double bottom from last January. On the, and on the bottom, if the oscillator gets below minus 400, it's oversold. You can see it hasn't been doing that too much in recent years, but it did do it here. This is the election. It did it right there at the election, so we got a nice buy signal there. So currently, we're hovering just in overbought territory right here. Frankly, when the market has been as strong as it is, I would have uh, normally expected to see breadth really get expansive and this thing to get very overbought like it did you know coming out of the double bottom uh, last year or even coming out of the brexit bottom last summer that, that's the brexit low right there but it didn't and so <clears throat> this particular rally seems to be slightly different uh, you know the, the stocks that I guess are going that are expected to do well with deregulation and tax cuts and those sorts of things are not all stocks. Uh, so we don't have the kind of breadth coming out of this rally or in this rally that we might have seen in the past. But we you know that's certainly not a problem to the rally. The rally's been very strong and you know you might have said in the past, well that's you know that's kind of a negative thing. So I might be looking to short this market. That's not the case at all. So this is just the way this market's behaving. It doesn't have hugely strong breadth every day. But uh, it has enough to keep it slightly in, in the overbought territory, and clearly, uh, the you know the trend of the market has been higher. So, um, just to note this, I mean these breadth oscillators are pretty short term; they can flip quickly. So <clears throat> I don't use them all by themselves. If I were to get a sell signal from breadth, which say had, say tomorrow was a negative day and a, you know, negative breadth and we got a sell signal there, I wouldn't jump in and short the market. I want to see confirmation for one of these other indicators, which is going to be 
much more difficult to come by. So <clears throat> just to, uh, you know, again, I guess re repeat what we said about breadth. Our oscillators are on buy signals, but not that far from sell signals. And we didn't get the kind of very overbought breadth that we would have expected, but it just doesn't make any difference. It's a bullish indicator. So finally, the fourth indicator that I look at is VIX. And there's a couple of things about VIX that are important. First of all, the trend of VIX is very important. In fact, I think that's probably the most, the major thing you want to look at is the trend of VIX. And generally, VIX trends opposite to market direction, uh, especially if the market's going down, VIX will be going up. If the market's going up, VIX can go sideways and not be a problem for stocks. Secondly, uh, spike peaks are eventually buy signals when they occur, not while the market, while VIX is rising, but eventually a spike peak is a buy signal. I'll show you a chart of that in a minute. And currently, we're in a very low VIX environment, so uh, it's overbought because it's low, but that's not bearish until it begins to rise. So we'll take a look at the chart of VIX. This is up to date. Uh, and first, we'll look at the spike peak. So we had, um, I'm just going to take this one here. This was uh, Brexit, and a VIX spiked up. Well, actually, first here, it spiked up and right back down again. So that gave us a buy signal, but right after that, it spiked even higher. So that canceled out that first buy signal, making it a loss. Then it came back down, and that was a good buy signal. Uh, we had one in September, which you may or may not remember. Again, VIX spiked up and back down. It was pretty decent. And then we had the one at the election. I have expired here because we have a trading system that we use to trade these buy signals, and they only last for a month. So that buy signal has expired. But what has happened is the VIX has come down in here and just trading at these very low levels uh, between 11 and really 13 these days. You can see here twice in December it got up just below 15 and it failed both times. And then more recently, it's got up towards 13 a couple of times, in fact, just yesterday, but it hasn't been able to punch on through. So in my, my way of thinking, as long as VIX stays down in this area here, stocks can continue to rise. It's not a problem. And you know you might hear these people on TV keep telling you, oh, VIX is cheap, buy protection. Well, the market has lower volatility than VIX. If VIX is trading around 12, let's say. The actual 20-day historical volatility of the S&P 500 index right now is about 6. So, you know, VIX, VIX isn't that cheap if, if the market is going to stay at 6. So you're really kind of overpaying for things. If, and you can lose a lot of money buying protection that way. So my, my thinking is as long as VIX stays below this, this 13, 13 and a half area, it's fine. Mark, the stocks will still be going up. And even if it breaks through there, I think it really needs to break through this area in order to really turn bearish. So if VIX breaks through there and starts heading higher, then that would be a sell signal. Otherwise, VIX is going to remain on an overbought buy signal uh, as far as stocks are concerned. So VIX is trend trendless. That's bullish for the S&P 500. Uh, as I said, below 13 and a half, which is really the, the January highs, it's not a problem unless it gets above that, uh, and then eventually, if it got above 15, then you know, then that's more severe uh, bearishness. But right now, VIX indicator remains bullish, and there's some other facets of VIX and the term structure of the futures, which we don't really have time to get into completely here, but they are uh, worth noting that those are also bullish. Now, <clears throat> Keane said this. The market can remain irrational for longer than you can remain solvent. And this could be one of those markets if you're short. <laughs> uh, but I have seen so many people talking about buying fix for protection or buying S&P puts for protection. And the implied volatility of S&P puts is really what VIX is. And so my corollary to this, VIX can remain low for longer than you can afford to keep losing money buying protection. So if you are going to buy protection, if you think you, you need it, I would wait until VIX makes that move. Then you can buy protection. And you know, it's still if VIX is going to make a big move, waiting until it gets above 15 is not going to be a problem. If it goes to 40, like it did in August of two years ago, there's plenty of room there for you to make money. But if you keep buying it down here at this level and just keep wasting your money every two, three weeks or month, uh, then that's bad. By the way, if you're going to trade VIX or any of these 
volatility products, you need to stay short term. Do not buy anything with longer than one month's duration. Those things will not perform. The, the longer term ones will not follow VIX up when it goes. Okay, so volatility, again, our conclusion here, we're bullish. Um, as I said, the construct, the thing I didn't really get to it, but that's bullish. VIX is trendless, that's bullish. And so overall, if we look, look back at over all these things we talked about, the SPX chart is bullish. The put car ratios are overbought, but still on buy signals. The breadth oscillators are on buy signals. VIX is bullish. Uh, the term structure is bullish. And so, you know, what can we say? We're bullish. So stay long. Uh, this is a, certainly a stop below 2300. Uh, you might want to, you know, keep a trailing stop on things, but right now, uh, this thing just keeps rolling, and you know, I, 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 it will turn eventually. But to say that you know we're going to try to pick the top, that's foolish. When all these things are still bullish, and their trends are bullish. So one last point: a VIX over the years has been calculated three different ways. Uh, the original VIX lasted for about 10 years, and that used OEX options in, in its calculations. Um, and the CBOE, uh, those are the main index options on the CBOE. But in 2003, uh, Goldman Sachs came to the CBO and said, look, we really need to change the way you're doing this because uh, these out-of-the-money puts are very important. And by that time, SPX options had become the top index option. So in 2003, they changed the way that they calculated VIX. And that stayed the same until 2014 uh, when they started using monthly s and I'm sorry, weekly S&P options uh, to calculate. So the, those are the two calculations of VIX. You can still quote them, VXO and VXMO, and of course the current VIX. So VXO and VXMO, VIX hasn't been this low, it was this low in 2000, 1993 and then in 2006, but it really hasn't been this low for this long since then. But back then we did some studies and there was a limited amount of data because VIX doesn't get this low. But if VXO closes below 10 and VXMO closes below 1050, that's an immediate sell signal. So we discerned this system in late 2006 and were able to catch a great trade in early 2007 when SPX was down 50 points in one day. It came five days after our signal, but in one day it was down 50. Chinese raised margin rates. The market went higher after that. It wasn't the end of the bull market or anything like that. Uh, but VIX never came back that low again until now. So recently, we've had several VXO closes below 10. Well, VXMO is not closed below 10.50. In fact, it was only closed below 11 once at 10.74 a couple of weeks ago. So we're keeping an eye on this. I mean, uh, you know, you might say, well, what what if we try to finagle it? Maybe say VIX, VXO below 10 and the current VIX below 11. I back tested that. It, it's okay, but it's not the kind of, you know, forceful sell signal that the other one was. So we're just kind of keeping an eye out. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, you know, we're no, no loss. Again, uh, just to repeat, if you go to this website, uh, Ken's going to mail you the, uh, the recording of this seminar. But if you go to this website, you can get some discounts on our products. If you're interested in those uh, put call ratio charts, it's the area called the strategy zone. This is my contact info. Uh, if you want that starting value for the breadth oscillator, I can send it to you. Just email me there. All right, Ken, I think I'm right on time at 830. Well, outstanding. I was really impressed to, especially like your analysis of the VIX, because I personally, I trade, I've been trading XIV on the way up, and I trade VXX and UVXY for bear markets, and your point about month-long life cycle is well taken, because you're right, those, uh, especially the leveraged VIX instruments, uh, 30 days is about as far as you're going to get a trend before it reverses, so that's a... And smart insight. So thanks for sharing. Let me ask you a quick question. You're the world's foremost authority on options. And I always like working with the world's best. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be working with someone of your stature in the industry. My quick parting question for you is, uh, and thousands of people will be watching this YouTube video in years to come, in all your experience, and you have more experience than anyone at this, uh, what's, say, the biggest lesson learned or something that you would share with traders who are maybe confused with options or struggling with options? Is there a common mistake that they make or is there a 
recommended first step that they could uh, take in addition to reading your book, which has sold 300,000 copies, which is more than most trading books put together. So that's outstanding. Um, I know the numbers. Uh, what would be a good kind of a parting thought in terms of advice for struggling traders who are struggling to understand options or uh, have made mistakes that you might want to advise them to uh, to make better trading decisions? Is there any kind of a lesson learned point that you would share with the world right. of traders? Yeah. Yeah, well, to me, the biggest mistake that, you know, uh, option traders make is to uh, buy them too far out of the money so that, yes, they could pay off huge if they pay off, but the probability of that actually paying off is very low. So if you have a decent stock trading system, say they're watching your swing trading signals or something like that, and you want to use options to trade those, uh, trade, trade it in the money option because then you're going to track the underlying about 85% of the time and you know uh, or 85% of the distance and if the signal is right if your trade is good then you're going to make money but a lot of times people try to buy an out of the money option and too short too short of a duration and the stock makes the move for them but they don't make any money on the option because they were too far out of the money and too short term. Mm, good, smart. Okay, thanks. Mental note to self. I took note for my own trading. So uh, thanks so much. And I highly recommend to the world's traders, absolutely get involved with Larry McMillan at optionstrategist.com. He has a managed fund as well as tons of educational content. Get his book, learn. He's one of the, the short list of people who I trust out there in the industry. He's a genuine expert, a world-class uh, top industry foremost expert in options. So thanks so much, Larry McMillan, for being here. I appreciate it. All right. Good. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And let me take control. Uh, big footsteps to, to follow. To follow up with that, uh, what I trade, I trade, I've been trading XIV on the way up. I don't know anyone else. Uh, if It's starting to show a little weakness lately. But if you look at the dailies, it's followed the meteoric rise this whole past year. The XIV has been a real firecracker. This is how I trade the market long is I don't trade the spiders or the index tight ETFs because uh, they're pricey. I mean, why trade SPY, you know, and pay a lot of money for it? I'm waiting for the chart here. Uh, why trade the SPY when I can trade the XIV instead? So I'm not noted for my patience. I'm a day trader. So anyway. XIV looks a little something like this. VXX, which is one of the, the bear inverse ETFs, which I trade, has been quite low lately. And when it starts to pivot, and so many people in our session tonight. Anyway, the point is, XIV is a good way to trade uh, the long side. Let's take a, anyway, or UVXY is another triple leveraged. I'm waiting for a bounce in UVXY. The reason for that is if you take a look quite a far, quite a few ways back, split adjusted price was way up in the sky back during the 2008 to 2012 sell-off. Uh, these are not instruments that you want to trade yet, as I mentioned in a money show uh, appearance a few months ago, because they're still on the decline. But because of the volatility in those, we're going to be able to see where things are headed. Anyway, let's take a look at tonight's charts. I'm Ken Calhoun. What I wanted to get at tonight, successful options traders focus on volatility. And we're going to look at the top current breakout charts as good food for thought for what you might want to look at when you're considering putting on your next options trade. Uh, just a quick uh, introduction here. I'm Ken Calhoun. Uh, I've been speaking at money shows for the last 17 years. Uh, as always, all information is for educational use only, and I'm making advice about what to buy, sell, or hold. Uh, you may have seen me. I'm a UCLA grad, a former quality engineer and statistician, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I do lots of seminars and work with people around the world. I've been, I'm a regular columnist in stocks and commodities with my monthly trading on momentum column, which is kind of like a Cliff's Notes for uh, great breakout trade setups and the rules of engagement for how those work. You may have seen me back in CBS Market Watch 16 years ago. It's uh, time flies when you're having fun. Anyway, what we're going to look at tonight is how to find strong breakouts in 20 minutes, setting your entries and exits, how to avoid false breakouts, momentum candlestick entries, and risk management uh, with much more. And what I want to do is get you up to speed. The two major mistakes, I've trained tens of thousands of traders in my life, and one of the, the 
biggest mistakes is taking too big stops, but the other is trading charts that are too choppy and not likely to produce successful trade outcomes. So one of the things I want to do uh, briefly here is go through these 15-day current charts of some really good examples of breakout charts because, again, you know, successful options traders focus on volatility. And when you're, uh, like Larry said, you don't want to buy deep out of the money options. Those are long shots. Uh, let me ask, let me start off with a quick question. There's so much to cover and a limited amount of time. What is your personal either biggest challenge? Uh, if you would type in right now your biggest challenge in trading options or a question that you might have. I know we're not going to have time for a lot of Q&A, but I will read off any challenges that you have or issues. One of the things that I would advise, a quick tip is, for example, Alcoa is a real nice breakout today, a nice minor gap. My favorite chart patterns are minor gap continuations. However, if you're an options trader or a swing trader, I advise against doing anything with anything that's still within a 15-day range. So to avoid, you know, having options expire worthless because the volatility isn't there and they don't hit your strike price by expiration date or whatnot, you want to trade instead charts that are out of the previous 15-day range. So I like buying 15-day high breakouts. I'm a professional breakout trader. I've traded millions of dollars worth of stock and ETF breakouts, and I like new highs. I buy high and I sell higher. And one of the things as an options trader can really help you, or if you're considering trading options, is to narrow your focus strategically and intelligently to the very strongest charts that have the best volatility. You know, I'm a professional trader, and uh, I make my money when I'm correct with good trend breakouts. If you're looking at implied volatility and historical volatility from a historical standpoint, one of the best patterns that I've covered in my money show appearances and my stocks and commodities and the now sadly defunct Active Trader Magazine articles is what I call an acceleration ramp. So if you're considering, uh, you know, whether it's uh, you know new entries looking for one where you have a steady uptrend that leads to a three to five day hockey stick breakout where you've got a sustainable uptrend continuation. That tells you you've got increasing volume and increasing volatility. That's likely to produce an in the money uh, options trade. You know, if you're, if you're still buying calls, I know uh, a lot of times traders may want to write out of the money OTM covered calls and, you know, or trade iron condors, which probably isn't a smart idea during a breakout rally market, maybe more for sideways markets, but, one of the things as an options trader is you've got to understand how options are priced, and especially with implied volatility. And one of the things that I encourage all of you to do as traders is focus your energy on charts in motion that have the best action or the best current volatility that had the best sustainable trends. One of the things I found in my significant experience of trading the last couple of decades is you want to, you know, kind of bet on sure things with sustainable uptrends. And so they are out there. Uh, we've got such a great rally market to work with. Which, you know, what you want to avoid doing though is, uh, you know, I haven't watched financial news TV in almost 15 years, is play news stories because news comes and goes. Instead, you want to look at technical price action breakout continuation charts. Like here's one I picked out for you guys. I, I just ran through my charts this afternoon to pick out a dozen or so hot charts for swing trading, you know, or if you're doing an options trades, these are the type of charts that you want to narrow your focus to that are getting increasing volatility in the most recent three to five trading days, okay? And the charts to avoid would be ones like, say, Alcoa, which had a big history of negative sell pressure. And yeah, I see the inverse head and shoulders here, and right there at the little left shoulder head, a right shoulder, I see the consolidation breakout above the high. For day trading, yes. For swing trading or options trading, no. And the reason I say that is a lot of you, I'm an expert in avoiding false breakouts because I've gotten faked out so many times, so many thousands of trades that I've learned over the last 20 years how to avoid false breakouts. Some charts are good for day trading, but not for swing trading. Some charts are good for, uh, for shorter term options. Some are better for longer term options trading. If you want a I won't call it a sure thing, but a better trade setup. You really want to focus instead on charts with sustainable trends, kind of like the character of people that you work with in your life. You want people that have an honest background and they pass a background check uh, because they're honest and they're hardworking and they're productive and they're authentic. And like the people I like to work with in this trading industry, which is uh, few and far between. So it's a real pleasure to work with top aces like uh, Larry. Anyway, you want charts that also have character and integrity and are likely to produce for you. 
Now you can go through various scanning services to find recent runners, but the problem is they will often produce charts, say like this one, that are recent. You know, they're recent and yeah, it's, it's on the radar, but I don't like the trend. So for that reason, I'm out. It doesn't, make, it doesn't meet my investment profile. I like charts that you have an uptrend, it slows down a little bit, then it gets a big rush of new buyers, kind of stop and go <clears throat> breakouts, and then a nice big spike up on new volatile price action. Here, these are the types of charts that as a seasoned trader, you want to really focus your energy on, ones that have more sustainable trends. Because isn't it true? We struggle with uncertainty all the time as traders, and you want to reduce uncertainty. And the best way to reduce uncertainty as a trader I have found in trading millions of dollars worth of these things is find continuous tight channeling uptrends that are reasonably wide on the range, which brings me to another point. Make sure that on a 15-day basis, we'll look at the daily charts in a second. This is just the first look. I'm a, a very active trader. I've done as many as 304 trades, real money trades in a single morning. So I'm a very hyperactive trader. But one of the things you wanna do is make sure you have a minimum 10% price action threshold or criteria range on the right side of the chart. So a $30 stock or $40 stock, in this case, $40 stock better have a four point minimum range. Where traders get into trouble is trade slow uptrenders like say AT&T. I always pick on AT&T. I have for almost 20 years. I'm sorry, AT&T, but you're just a perfect example of a horrible chart to trade. It's got a three or two, two point range on a $40 stock. The math doesn't add up. That's a stupid chart to trade. I've been telling traders that for decades now. Charts like this, however, that have say 33 to 37, that range is another critical variable to look at. So the three things you wanna look at are trend strength, trend sustainability, trend strength slash sustainability, the price action range. I used to be a statistician and quality engineer for the Ford Motor Company, outstanding management team, uh, and worked in aerospace and defense at Rockwell International, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, and back in the days when quality management and dimming and total quality were in vogue, that was my expertise. And I worked with a lot of manufacturing and engineering companies with control charts and parameter charts. And then we, I took that into the trading industry. We're looking for signal strength. And as a trader, you want to have windows or gap continuations is obviously the number one chart pattern you need to focus on as a professional trader. I look at it, I learned that from Steve, that they're called, Steve Ness and uh, candlecharts.com, that those are called windows. I look at it like a window that opens and a lot of Benjamins are flying in, a lot of money flies in. So the gaps continue the vast majority of the time. Anybody who says gaps fade, I won't call it total moron, but isn't a professional trader. Experts, we all of us know that gaps are buying signals if it's under 10% of a gap. If six, say a $30 stock that gaps a point, I will always buy a new high. Uh, a $30 stock that gaps up to 40, not so much. That may fill the gap. So you need to know the difference. But anyway, these minor gaps, even on these cheap charts, you know, $8 to $12 ran up 30%. Minor gaps that continue. Nice volatile, high volatility instruments make a lot of sense. For the ETF traders, like the FAS Finance Triple, uh, that's been a nice uptrender for quite, quite a long time. If you look at the daily, it's been tracking the S&P as it is wont to do. You also wanna look at sectors, you know, like for example, the gold miners sector has been, if you look at the interval chart, we finally got a breakout in dust, which means they're selling crude, or I'm sorry, they're selling gold bullion. Look at say GDX and Newmont. I've traded these things for years, not currently because they're going down. I buy things that go up. But gold has been weak, so the inverse ETF dust has been on a nice big price action breakout with high volume and high volatility. That's a signal, and we're definitely not too late. I sold this at 56 back the last time it spiked up in my real money trade account. Uh, and if you look at, say, a three-month chart in this guy, I didn't get the exact top, but I got close. Anyway, this thing has traded within a range here, the mid-20s up, up to the low 60s or high 60s, low 70s. Anyway, the point is it may start to pivot. If you are a pivot trader, wait for things to get above the 50, 100, or 200 moving averages. That's another signal. I prefer not to be a pivot trader. I'm a breakout trader. That's what I do for a living. So I like to trade the strongest of the charts that have sustainable trends. 
Clues can be found if you look at the three-month daily candlestick chart in terms of relative strength of these charts. One of the things that I like to look at that you may find helpful is to see at least 70 to 80% green candles in the last couple of weeks of the trading week. You know, that's another good thing for directional options plays. You know, you're looking for not only the implied volatility moving forward, but historically, what is the volatility in terms of the price action range been and how to use that to extrapolate a strike price, you know, if you're looking at trading your options, if you're buying calls or selling puts or whatnot. So anyway, one of the good strong signals that I'm trying to get across to you uh, to teach you tradable instruments in the first place, which is one thing, you know, what Larry was teaching you is absolutely vital. I, I teach, I, and I also yeah, I like to focus on trading markets first. You know, if you look at our S&P, it's been in a great uptrend continuation. Okay, trade markets first and then sectors second. You know, which of the sectors are starting to run up? The VIX was actually up the biggest today. A little bounce in the gold sector. Uh, but typically, biotechs and the pharmaceutical sector has been the strongest sector in recent weeks. So you drill down as a trader. This is also useful if you're using a scanning service, you know, like the various, you know, the free so software out there, the free charts or the premium scanning so services. What you need to do as a professional trader in development is make sure you've got a trading plan that removes as much ambiguity as you can. You know, that really helps keep you out of trouble. At least it's kept me out of trouble in my own trades because I like to focus first on what are markets doing. And it's not just enough to see the S&P because, I mean, yeah, you can do what I do in trade XIV, but you need to kind of slice and dice the market and drill down a bit and see which industry groups or which major sectors. For example, the pharmaceutical index and biotechs have been relatively strong lately, right? So once you understand relative strength in you know, in the various sectors, and insurance had been strong too, right? Insurance sector had been up quite a bit along with the market. Anyway, as a professional trader, what you then do is drill down into the strongest of the charts and find out, hey, how do I develop a trading plan that's likely to profit? How can I make money and stay out of trouble as an intelligent trader? And you're looking for these types of patterns. Here's another one of my favorites that I've taught for years is a large candle at the right side of a consolidation or a bullish cup. You know, we had a shooting star right here, right? When sure enough, that led to sell off for a week and a half, but buyers finally came back in. And we see a story of increasing whole row body candle heights with a large signal candle at the right side. So that means we'd be looking for a long, it's a 50 cents or so above the high, somewhere north of 43.70 or so. Anyway, as you visually look for strategic entries, it really helps to kind of narrow or isolate these strong charts and be able to develop a trading plan that really you know, produces winning entries for you. Where trouble, traders get in trouble, number one, is taking two big stops. How many of you have ever, say, bought an out-of-the-money call that's expired worthless? How many of you have let it just grind its way uh, to a slow and steady death? Show of hands and be honest. By the way, I say this at my money show appearances. If you hide your trading losses from your spouse, you might have a little bit of a problem. Just a little humor there, but you know, if you conceal your trading losses from your significant other, uh, like I don't tell my my wife about all my losses, but I tell her about all my wins. Uh, but you might have, at least back in the early days. Uh, anyway, now I like to shout downstairs and say, "Hey, honey, guess how much I made?" And she's Omodeito. She's from Japan. I still don't understand her, but the point is, uh, uh, how many of you have ever bought an out of the money column that expires worthless? Now, one of the, the tips is, you know, you don't have to lose your entire premium. You can scale out halfway. If you're, if it's looking bad, you don't have to hold on to it till expiration. You can get out with a little bit of kind of like surrender and blackjack. You can leave half the chips on the table. All right. So, and I agree with Larry too. You never buy deep out of the money options. Those are long shots, like a lottery ticket. You know, there's all kinds of ways to lose your money in the market, many more so than there are to, to make money. And I found out the hard way, it's all about signal strength, about how strong these charts are. And there is no magic indicator. I mean, it's called price, okay? And secondarily volume, and that's kind of it. Like my longtime colleague, Tim Berkman, who founded the original Traders Expo said, uh, he used to run a trader interview site. He said the world's best traders that he interviewed focus on those two signals only, price and volume. And I completely agree. You can look at derivative uh, technicals, for example, of things Breakout above major moving averages might be a pivot sign, and you can use the average directional index is okay. But the main thing that I rely upon is price action, and I look at sustainable price action above all else. 
Okay, and as an options trader, it's especially important that you have a keen understanding of the delta or the difference between sustainable trends and in the rest of it. Good successful trading is much more about money management than chart patterns. And I see a lot of crestfallen faces when I speak in my live seminars in Vegas or New York or do my money show appearances there and, and elsewhere. Uh, but successful chart pattern is not about becoming a technical analyst. It's a lot more about P&L management. Once I'm in the money in a trade, once I'm active in a trade and the trade is live, my focus shifts almost exclusively to the dollars. That's the, the biggest technical indicator. That just as a friend or a colleague, I'm telling you, your biggest technical indicator once your trade has been live is the dollars up or dollars down. Because, you know, how many of you have ever bought a breakout that looks to be good and then it fakes you out? And you say, well, surely it'll find support at so-and-so, and it doesn't, and you take a bath and you lose a lot of money. You do that a few thousand times like I have and you screw up, you learn there's got to be a better way. Stop the madness. So instead, you focus on good professional price action breakouts, like signals that are repeatable, like this one, a large green candle at the right side of a bullish cup. I mentioned that in one of my stocks and commodities article because it's a rock star pattern. I wait until 50 cents or so above the high to avoid a false breakout. And I'll often wait a day or two after the signal day to get in because I usually am suspicious after a big breakout. I say, well, I don't think so. I'll wait a day or two and see what the, the peanut gallery is going to do and then get in once institutional guys get in. You know, I, I'm a professional at following the money. You got to be a bloodhound. Got to be like Sherlock Holmes. You know, like the great TV series with uh, Lucy Liu Elementary, which I'm a big fan of because I like Lucy Liu, but I digress. The point is what you're looking for are charts that actually have good sustainable price action and momentum that's likely to do well for you, that are going to be well-behaved and well-mannered. Okay, not unlike people you want to deal with. You don't want to deal with the, I won't use colorful language, but people who are unpleasant. You want to deal with charts that are likely to you know, continuously go up and avoid charts that are too volatile. For example, Weight Watchers was a good breakout today, right? We had a nice big run up and in my live trading room, we made calls on this guy on the breakout and nailed it. But this would not be good for an options trade, would not be good for a swing trade because it's too uncertain. I mean, yeah, it's a hot chart, but it could just as easily next week be back down to 14. Like, remember the Twitter runs up and down, or dry ships, D-R-Y-S, run up and run down, went to 15 to two. So don't be that guy or that trader that takes options trades to the extreme where you're trading inconsistent chart patterns. You want consistency wherever you go as a trader. Because again, your main goal as a professional trader is just to slowly grind away and slowly bank mm -hmm carefully, cautiously, conservatively. I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado, home of the US Air Force in Fort Carson. We are so conservative here, you can't even make a left turn. Bada boom. A little joke there, but it's true. And I, I fit right in, I don't notice it. I, I guess I, that means I'm totally conservative. As a trader, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an ace day trader and a swing trader, but I'm ultra conservative when it comes to my money because like Mr. Wonderful would say, those are my soldiers that I put out there to work in the market. It's like casting a net out into the ocean and you don't want the sharks to chew through the net and let all the fish that you've captured because one bad trade can wipe out, you know, 10 or a dozen good trades. So what you want to do is make sure you don't have one big bad trade. Make sure that you're trading to start off with the strongest chart patterns are the most consistent ones that you can find as a smart, intelligent trader. And be on the lookout for these big honking green signal candles. It says buyers in the house. They were excited today. This was kind of a bullish engulfment, right? It started from below. It traversed the price action of the previous. Not technically a bullish engulfment because that needs to occur at a bottom like a hammer. But it engulfed. It's an engulf. It had a, this is a shooting star. We had an engulfing type of a price action. That's a signal, right? This thing ran, what, 30 to 38 today. Eight points. Doesn't mean I'm going to trade, get all trip over myself to trade it tomorrow, I'll likely wait till, you know, next week and like, wake me if it gets over 40.5, which is where I would buy it. Or, and again, not a trade recommendation, but I, I tend to not get so excited. It's just the next of my next 10,000 trades. So I'm trading a basket of trades and I encourage you to think about your trading the same way. Remember, we are just dating these. It's like you're out there speed dating a lot of different instruments. You're not getting married to any of them. So to avoid being overly dependent on a specific magic technical indicator or guru or service out there from an educational standpoint and a trade management standpoint, don't put all the eggs in one basket. You know, I may be in a dozen, 15, 18 swing trades at a given time. 
or you know if you're looking at your options trades you may want to hedge your bets by trading a handful of options plays and not just do you know one or two magic ones and over bet those instead spread the risk and then spread your your approach to trading a little more cautiously from an increasing volatility standpoint here's one of my more favorite patterns in network appliances i used to trade this back in the 90s this or the early 2000s too that was one of the day trader stocks anyway if you have increasing volume a sequence of increasing volume bars like we see here and increasing whole real body candles that's a hot stock right doesn't mean we're going to trip over ourselves to get into a position right now but it bears putting on the radar because watching it say for the next few days to see does price get over 43 and a half does it get over 44 always use whole numbers as a kind of a default support resistance and always use the decade values as kind of a decision point like 40 you know or i guess 30s way down here but whole numbers especially multiples of 10 tend to be key resistance or support levels so always mark that out visually on your charts you want to be a professional price action trader especially for options or swing trades you have to look at the differentiation between those charts that actually make sense to trade and everything else now, i hope this has been helpful i got just a couple of minutes left here but be on the lookout for large signal candles at the right side of congestion boxes or bullish cups it's a pattern i've taught for many years it's been copied by competitors but i originated a lot of the breakout momentum that's why that's one of the big reasons why i document a lot of my training in the stocks and commodities magazine because i invent a lot of these things and they get borrowed and ripped off by a lot of second-rate educators out there so i like to for my background in total quality management we document what we do and we do what we document with standard operating procedures that we always look to improve as a trader you want to have a bank account your trading account that you're always looking to make more money you want to feed your winning trades and starve your losing trades add to your winners scale in position size as my colleague van tharp would call it uh, or scale out of the positions that aren't doing well so you know don't sacrifice your entire premium if you're in a uh, it looks like a time decay is going to chew up uh, the entire thing don't lose lots of money doing that you can always scale out be more grade a how to say my institutional clients would, would call it graded trading or you're doing more gradations of your trades where you're kind of slicing in and out of your trade with a little more granularity than all in and all out which is an amateur's way of trading incorrectly okay so those are my thoughts. Uh, you know, I want to, you know, give you guys some good, good heads up on the types of charts, at least the ones that I like to trade, because I mean, they're rock star charts, so they're likely to keep running. So that's why I trade them. You know, see the trick. I'm a professional breakout trader. It's what I do. I buy high and I sell higher. Look at yourself, and I mentioned this in my premium events, as a seller uh, of instruments. And obviously, in options, you know how to do that. If you're writing out of the money OTM covered calls, or you're, you're, uh, you know, you're looking at how to, uh, you know sell look at yourself as a seller that's something that a lot of traders don't do they look at themselves only as buyers that hope not to get bitten look at yourself as a seller who's buying wholesale and as a professional trader whether you're trading options or swing trading or day trading you're looking at trading patterns that are likely to produce wins for you all right so you know the, the first thing is understand where your risk management strategy is and how to play it tighter and trade more instruments take more options plays out there trade more underlying instruments uh, so you've got a tighter focus and you have a less committed on any one you know instrument focus because i don't care how any one of my trades does I, I could i could give a rip right i am completely uncommitted to any of them i'm dating a whole bunch of them it's like going out on dates with you know a dozen women if one of them misbehaves you just don't call her back you got 11 others to to play the field with and same thing with your trades you're dating these things. You're not getting married to them. You're just trying to extract value out of the trade, make your money, roll the capital back into your account, and then on to the next set of trades or the next rack of five or eight or 10 or 12 trades. All right. So anyway, let me wrap up because I always end on time. If you want to join me and 4,374 other people who registered for my popular insanely popular 20-minute saturday webinars that's a great way to get involved with me you get my key s p support and resistance market forecast plus several hot stocks and etfs and i even throw in a hot currency pair for boots and for uh, for good measure and i like to uh, give tips and strategies 
go to my site at www.trademastery.com and you can forward slash free or just at the top of trademastery.com. There's a go to webinar link. Number one in the industry. No one else has 4,300 people registered that I've seen at least. So I've been doing these for many years. I've been doing Saturday webinars on and off to, since 2001. Uh, but I just started doing them on GoToWebinar every Saturday, I don't know, three, four years ago, and they've been a real hit. So it's a good way to get to know me, uh, you know, get some free tips and advice. Uh, virtually no selling. It's virtually all content. I'll, I'll mention something that I've got in terms of a, you know, a bonus or a flash sale or a subscription that's on sale or something. But mostly it's market forecast and hot charts and a little bit of coaching thrown in for good measure. Love to see you guys there. You've been amazing. I wanted to thank all of you for being here with uh, me and Larry McMillan. It's uh, been a real honor to share the stage with Larry and it's been great having you all here.